uh, spend some time pouring some rubber if you've never poured any of these sets of devices. Uh, but the big thread to start with was really around project discussions, making sure that you guys are ready for Thursday. No, was that Tuesday or Thursday? Tuesday. It was Tuesday. Okay, so that's literally uh, right after the weekend. Can you guys hear me? Huh. Yes. I am unmuted yes. now. Um, can you guys hear me online? Yes. Yes. Okay, I think Tapan says that they can hear me, except well, this is always a challenge. Yeah, so the folks that missed yesterday, uh, Tuesday is gonna be the class um, uh, first project presentations. All you have to do is uh, really put together at least the first column, but possibly the second column. So the functional requirements and the design parameters for whatever you're working on. This will also be the time if you are just the one person team to recruit other people. And what I would want to see is folks that are online and folks that are here, that there is some amount of intermingling between the teams while none of that is a requirement. Uh, you can have teams of one, two, three, whatever you choose. You can have sub teams inside a broader team itself. Uh, but the most important part is going to be is to just make sure that now we are committing to a problem. Because we have, we have maybe six weeks, less than six weeks. So, yeah, so that's not that much time. And I think Every tool that we have used so far and learned in the class from back of the envelope. Uh, and then of course, this is also going to be the time for particular projects. There are certain sets of external people that we will also engage, uh, but let's do that kind of uh, at a rapid pace. Jack. Um, Jackson. Yes. Um, is the homework assignment done individually or? All homeworks are done individually. Uh, all homeworks are on you guys. You want to do it, you should do it. You don't want to do it, you don't do it, then you don't learn. Uh, so I'm not checking. Uh, I am expecting that you're all at a scale where I don't have to check. Yeah. Just, but it's not like a team-based assignment. I think you can do it as a team-based assignment. I think the way you should think about everything you do in the class is do something useful. If you found a problem that is so important, like you were calculating the number of mosquitoes on the planet, that's a pretty important thing. It doesn't matter if all of you pulled together and did something. As long as what you do is something that you are seriously considering and you're putting your time in. It's not about, I think, everything that you can do in teams. It's the final product that matters, right? So, uh, and the more you practice, that skill is what matters. So you can take one assignment, do it five times, uh, I mean, some of you started playing with pulse scopes. Uh, I see Selena's post uh, the sticker on the computer. I used to have my sticker until I lost my computer. Uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think, I mean, you could do it once and you could do it a hundred times and it will totally transition and change how you think about the microscopic world. Yes. That's correct. Tuesday, we're all presenting Fred Parks as much as you can fill. And today we will do is we will walk around and just talk and people will just feel open in terms of amongst the idea board. So I'm gonna open the idea board for a second. Um, can somebody remind me where on Discord is the idea board link? Um, and I think if they're not populated, let's make sure for the sets of problems that we have discussed quite a lot, I don't think I have had the time to populate the board yet. So let's make sure that if there are problems that are not populated. Uh, okay, so I see the idea board as a, oh, announcements. Uh, how do I find pin message? Okay. 9th February, uh, Abina's post. Uh, would this be the one? 
Okay. Got it. And then did people transfer some of the idea board threads from the last years to this as yet? Or because it's perfectly okay to pick up something from a year ago or a couple of years ago, that doesn't really matter so much. Uh, so maybe kind of one thread that people can do is uh, either online or folks, uh, I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, the folks that have actually chosen some sense. And I think one thing that we're trying to do is we're doing this in the context of a discussion uh, and it's perfectly okay if it's ill-formed, but in this discussion, we're gonna try to refine it uh, to make sure that uh, the project is kind of in the right scope. And even for when you choose something, it's valuable to have a discussion of what is the most urgent thing we will do for the next four to five weeks. Uh, Shannon, go ahead. Thank you. I had uh, two, two things to say. Oh, One, can, just introduce, uh, Shannon, can you introduce yourself? Yes. For all the um, global participants, uh, we ask. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Uh, my name is Shannon, and I am uh, part of uh, the Fab Lab uh, All Fair in Geneva. And I had the, the chance to go to the Bali Fab Fest and work with Manu before with the Fold Scopes. So I uh, had enjoyed that. And I originally am a model maker, so I work a lot with my hands. And I'm specializing in the lab, 3D printing, numerical embroidery machine, biomaterials, and a lot of a lot of stuff. So uh, a lot of uh, creative things. I had, yeah, two things. I, I While I was trying to find the idea boards, I think I accidentally went to the old idea board without realizing and put it some comments there. And I would say, do do that because I got a message from an old uh, 2020 uh, frugal science person who was really interested of what I was, I, I said. So do, yeah, so old topics can bring back other people from before. So that was really cool. And secondly, you were talking about columns. Uh, we need to fill in columns and I did not quite know what you meant, meant by that. For the for um, the presentation or oh, for Tuesday, yeah, I think uh, the columns I meant is the Fred Park, and I think one thing you'll have to do, Shannon, is if Elaine is around, ask her and she'll walk you through that lecture. There was a lecture that we covered. Uh, that's ah, going to be see. in the assignment. Yeah, uh, beautiful. So Thank you. One one nomenclature comment uh, we call uh, both current and past members of the class frugalists. Somebody named that a couple of years ago. And so that's become a term. Uh, and I think this is what I meant to say that all of these things that you're seeing, people are still active in the same community. And it's actually quite fun uh, to engage with some of the past members because they've now had a longer time on their projects itself. And it's perfectly okay to pick up from, uh, you know, unless you solve a problem, uh, it doesn't matter in terms of whether you actually, how much time it has passed. So just the fact that it was posted a year or so ago, uh, you could choose anything between uh, what's currently posted and what's on the current idea boards. Okay, so I think already there is tons of things here. Uh, I don't know if uh, people want me to call out names or if folks that are excited that are feeling strongly around a given idea itself, we can just go around. Uh, people can break the ice. It can always be hard sometimes when you're in an early phase of an idea to talk about it because you kind of feel like, oh no, my idea might not be good enough. That's exactly when you want to talk about it because in the act of conversation is when the idea gels in you. In the act of trying to formulate it is when you start really thinking. So. In the early phase, you should talk to everybody and anybody about what you're thinking about. So with that as a starting point, uh, do people want to pick up uh, certain sets of threads? Uh, I could pick up some of my words here already, but I think it would be useful just for people to, we can start from folks in the class itself. Uh, anybody who's formed teams that is now sort of starting to gel? Okay, yes, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess the for is really connecting based on like the connect uh, question that was here because the similar threads. So it talks a lot about experimenting and monitoring the things that we can't see with our eyes on the day to day. Um, but we're still kind of identifying our parameters, whether we want to focus on like green or terrestrial environment. Um, and so it's raised a lot of questions about like microbial life. Mm -hmm. Um, so but I think the general parameters. 
other that we've started to figure out are like one it being like a key DNA measurement tool mm -hmm. and also like something that can be measuring things like in the background almost like you don't have to actively be taking examples but we're like playing off the QI like, like we walk through that like, uh, that's how the we Remembers kind of the eDNA threads that we discussed, right? Um, you have to choose a context. So you've chosen a technology, that's great, but you have to choose a context that you're going to apply in. So although it sounds the terrestrial and marine is so automatically different, uh, the more narrow you make your problem, the more likely you are to actually succeed. So because the sets of things will change dramatically. So just for at this moment, if you were your hand was forced, what would you choose between terrestrial versus marine? I think it's just useful for the sake of this discussion, because let's try to take that discussion and turn that into what is the functional requirements for this project. And then this is a discussion. So just because they're working on it doesn't mean that your brain shuts off. So anybody can shout out the functional requirements for that project whatever you think is useful, what should we put down that we will be held accountable for in terms of whether we say it's a success or not? Uh, and then I think this is also true for anybody who's online uh, and especially Smriti and other folks uh, who wanna talk about the functional requirements side. Uh, so what should I put on this column? Uh, I think in embedded in this thing, you have put this requirement around molecular, right? So because you use the word eDNA, uh, there is somehow an inherent assumption that it's going to be a molecular detection tool, right? You could not use that word because then you don't uh, box the technology. We could use something about the specificity of molecular is what you're looking. But if there was another way to get to the same specificity, then it might not be that it doesn't have to be a nucleic acid based, right? Mm -hmm. So this is where, you know, if you're trying to detect something in the environment, we'll take the example of sharks in water, it's the fun one, uh, because we have talked about it in the past, uh, you would wanna know for what dilution, uh, so sensitivity, specificity, like do you wanna actually know which particular species of shark, uh, and then suddenly the sets of things will start narrowing down. So these sensitivity specificity would be two numbers that we would need to write down. Because we chose context, which was marine, that makes for a pretty challenging scenario because um, why is the marine a little more challenging? Does anybody want to, yeah. You have to go to the ocean. That's true. That's yeah, because otherwise, how else do you get actually a sample like that? So the technology has to go to the ocean, maybe, right? Which makes it complicated. Uh, while you could also think of a very specific context, no, that I, the species I want to be is marine, but I want to operate in ports around the world where illegal trade might be happening. So then the technology doesn't need to go to the ocean, samples are coming back. And again, you have to make a choice. So what choice do you want to make? Just for the sake of this discussion. <laughs> yeah. Because I think otherwise, what you will write will not be so meaningful. That's the challenge. What we're trying to do is narrow, narrow, narrow to a point where you feel, oh, I can see this thing. I don't know what it's going to be, but I can see a form somewhere, sitting somewhere that does this exactly. Yeah, we also talked about how like to be very definite about what we mean by sampling or yes. like where it's going to be. In yeah how much sampling you really need to be representative of an idea. And I think with the ocean, the big issue is volume because yeah. of the dilution factor. Everything in the ocean gets diluted, so you end up in a situation where you need to account for the total volume. Uh, so what would be the, uh, how would you, what are the other things that we would think about in here, for example? Any other functional requirements? I guess, did we choose? Is this a seagoing technology? Is this something that sits on ports? Mm -hmm. Is it something that in a sushi restaurant, 
is another place you can meet eDNA and all these. You can make a random choice. It's like this is literally playing a game of making a choice, writing things down and say, no, 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 I don't like that as a, it doesn't solve the real problem that I'm trying to solve. So I think all I'm trying to say here is for the purpose of the class, don't be technology first. Although you can have a desire of using something like this, be problem first. And so we're just flipping that around. We're taking roughly this space, but we are trying to find the correct problem that will just get you so excited that you guys would work hard on that specific problem. Yeah. Uh, and so in that scenario there, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, so like for the purposes of the class, mm -hmm. like practically it's a lot harder to go to the ocean, grab samples from the ocean versus walking around campus and maybe grabbing samples. Yeah. Is that like something we should be considering or should we like, like assume that we could get access to samples? Assume that you have all the access in the world for exactly the problem that you want. And then there is a prototype phase where you uh, can fake samples temporarily. That's easy enough to do. And this is, we do it in all the projects. Uh, these are called phantoms. We can create like the first set of a scenario that is done. We can get genomic DNA for everything that you desire, that you test all of that would happen here and then transition. But I think what's important in here is for it to be narrow enough for it to be relevant. That's what I'm trying to say, because I think you will otherwise wander in a situation which will be too broad. So, uh, how, yes. I think for now, for, for this discussion, it could yeah. be fun to play around with like deep ocean. I don't know what layer. That's great. Um, yeah, I think this is fun. Certainly. Suddenly you've taken it into a place where there is very little. So uh -huh. now when you've suddenly added, now finally I have a feeling for what question that is actually unmet. So now when we talk about the deep ocean and when we discuss deep ocean sampling technologies, it's a huge issue. It costs so much to get there to begin with. We should know so much more. So just because the submersibles, when they go down and they photograph a given portion, what they see is what they see. But it's like needle searching for a needle with a flashlight. You just see it in front of your flashlight. What about the million other miles right around there that they didn't see? And you could then see value of eDNA. Mm -hmm. The other really fun thing about this, and it's explicitly this is the time to think about this, is because the mining uh, of the nodules. I don't know how many of you have heard of the manganese nodules. Nobody? OK, so this is a very serious problem. Uh, it's, I'm surprised that you guys haven't heard about it, because, because this should be all over the news. Uh, there is a large number of companies currently in the market that are trying to mine the deep sea because there happen to be precious metals in the bottom of the ocean. These are called manganese nodules. Most of our cell phones, many of our technologies utilize these metals. What is problematic? I mean, the, the literally the minerals are literally sitting at the bottom of the ocean. All they have to go is pick it up. And so... Tons of companies have formed around this. There's a large amount of VC capital that's been raised. What do you think might be the problem with this approach? We're going to mine the deep. Yes. Disrupting ecosystem. We're going to disrupt an ecosystem that we don't even know about. And suddenly, this becomes a huge issue. So there are two big problems here. One is because we don't know much about uh, the deep sea, we don't know who lives there. Especially in the microbial context, we have no idea what lives there. And then thirdly, all of the carbon sequestration stuff that we talked about in sedimentation is what keeps the carbon locked down. If we now have mining operations in the deep sea, any amount of time when you kick the dust up, it essentially starts recirculating. So we're then introducing carbon back to the same yeah, I think that was a good idea. <laughs> We're introducing carbon back into the water column, which is all of that sequestered carbon from even uh, 50,000 years ago is actually being reintroduced, which is problematic because we don't want more carbon to begin with. Uh, and then, of course, the cost of most of these technologies don't account for anything related to disrupting uh, the ecosystem or relating to the carbon context. So 
So, I mean, now suddenly you've narrowed where it doesn't matter whether you're going to detect it with eDNA or anything. It's a problem that sort of feels urgent. And the reason this is also urgent is there are very few laws around who's allowed to mine in the open ocean. Mm -hmm. So then you can't even say that, oh, unless like CRISPR, right now it's outlawed that you cannot modify human babies all around the world. But many times you cannot even build a law like that uh, in the context of the ocean for most times. So you then end up with a, so I, I like this a lot. Now, suddenly it also narrows down to the types of samples because sediments would be the most exciting. But also the challenge here is if we want to build a molecular tool, there is also a lot more unknown rather than known. Most of our molecular technologies are geared towards detecting what is known. Because you know, if you're going to look for a shark, I'm going to get the primers for that particular species. While mo most of the time, anybody who goes to deep sea, you realize you get every single time you pick something, you're going to get new things. So then suddenly it questions uh, the tool a little bit that maybe it should not be a eDNA based technology. Maybe it should be sequencing based mm -hmm. so that it's generalist. You will catch whatever you catch and you don't know what that is. Uh, so I think this is the purpose of F, the functional requirements column is that you go through this process independent of where you were starting, where it becomes problem first, because then I have a sense of knowing whether these requirements, even if magical technology existed, does it even solve the problem? And that's kind of the number one thing I want you guys to do is to not be technology focused, but problem focused. Uh, what else for the deep sea? So now we can think a little bit about the design parameters now we have opened up the problem a little bit. We want a low cost technology that's going to sample the deep sea and get a sense for what's there. Uh, now you can be completely wild and crazy about how we might want to achieve something like that. So what comes to mind? Uh, how would we want to sample the deep sea in a manner that's cost effective? Well, I feel like one way to save on costs is like if you don't have to retrieve the device. Yeah. Just like leave it down there. And yeah. Set this up back. Yeah. So yeah. So I think that would be now in one, you're already breaking this down, whether this is a technology which is a sampling problem or whether it's that, no, 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 you actually detect everything down there. Um, uh, there are a couple of kind of threads that become uh, threads in. I think so now in this functional requirements, you are starting to break down. If you care about this, there is the detection. So there will be what we were literally talking about was only detection. By choosing the word deep, you have added another functional requirement, which is sampling. If you can't sample, you can't detect anything if you can't sample, which is a completely different set of functional requirements. And you might have to again make this choice whether there is any sampling that happens or whether the device is in situ. Like we do, we take stuff to Mars. We don't step back. You don't send ship things back. You actually do whatever analysis you do there. The problem is it's easier, and this is, goes back to design parameters. It's easier to talk to a device that's sitting on Mars than it is on a device that's sitting in the marina trench or at the bottom of the ocean because communication is a huge issue. Water absorbs oral wavelengths, so you cannot. So there is only one project that I know, they've been trying to do laser-based communication underwater, uh, and that's hard, but I think it's feasible. Uh, uh, so that's the challenge, that if you could go send something, if you don't retrieve it, then you haven't uh, detected. But there might be passive ways of retrieving. I mean, I can think of one or two. So how would you passively retrieve a sample you have, you have nothing than a small boat. You want to sample the bottom of the ocean and retrieve it. Yeah. Deep sea ocean rovers. rovers. Yes. So rovers would be fun. And I think this is kind of the current standard right now, but we want to break that paradigm because these rovers are very expensive. I think it just, the, the reason much of the deep sea is not mapped is primarily because the expedition 
getting things in only a few people i know some people in this you know i don't know if anybody here has a rover <laughs> but very few people do have these rovers but that's it's not sufficient for the surface area i mean 70 percent of the surface area of the planet is deep sea so we're i mean a handful of rovers are not going to do the trick if you really want to think of what else can we think about yes you can freeze some amount of samples or samples uh, yeah. under the bottom like that and then it blows up by itself and you just so that's actually kind of one way of passively this is this is when you a lot of stuff goes up you know i think uh, i don't know if you guys know about this term buoyancy engines so buoyancy engines are a very simple idea where if you can do a chemical reaction that produces a gas, it suddenly changes density and stuff from the bottom will naturally come up. Uh, and it has been used in many types of passive gliders, but it can even be as simple as something that falls down and at a given point of time passively rises back up. You still have to collect it. Uh, so now, I think we have a semblance of this is so much more interesting in some sense than thinking about the rover, just because lots of people are working on the rovers. They're working on classical ways of collecting samples, bringing them back up, analyzing them. That's the standard. I think what you want to do and think about is how do you change that standard? Yes. Yeah. In addition to like using gas to push things up, you can also do something that its density changes over time. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think now suddenly we are talking about, we are in column number two. So, and this you want to fill in with hundreds of ideas because we will have kind of the counter arguments and an analysis to strike them down, but you want to make sure that you will fill this up as much as possible. So let's, let's come up with more things. So I like uh, buoyancy passive rising is good. Um, you guys know, I, I mean, I think I have to mention this. This is historically, in oceanography, it was thought that the deep ocean is dead mm -hmm. for the longest time because below 300 meters, 250 meters, there was no light. So people always thought that there is actually no life underwater. Uh, and it's actually a subtle point. The deep sea ecology, because we were so used to thinking about light is the primary producers, then the primary producers, the secondary producers. This is what happens in terrestrial context. So how can there be life? If there is no primary producer, that is true. And people had not discovered marine snow. So it turns out a lot of dead stuff goes down, sinks. Even when a whale sinks down, it supports a ton of life at the bottom. But there is also other kinds of life forms that don't actually, uh, you know, there is life that only derives energy from heat, from chemistry, just methane, sulfur. So there is a lot of other type of life that's uh, not dependent on our classic sort of photosynthetic uh heterotrophic pathways so one of the things to think a little bit about it how did people for the first time discover that there was life at the bottom of the ocean they didn't have rovers at that time you guys know i mean darwin was involved in this everybody knows that famous expedition that he did on beagle mm -hmm. uh, he documented some of it and they used a very classical, uh, quite uh, destructive technology that we still use today in fishing, which is called the bottom sea trollers. Mm -hmm. So you throw a passive metal element, you drag it along and you just let it grab and whatever it, it, it kind of literally scratches whatever is on the surface, brings that up. And it was a huge surprise when they saw all kinds of life forms in those dragnets. And that was sort of, so, we want to do better than that, but at least that was there in the 1800 itself. People have been thinking about this idea of uh, deep sea sampling. It was not molecular, it was all macroscopic, but people were quite surprised that you found all kinds of fish, all kinds of starfish, for example, showed up. And there's some really beautiful writings around that time of how they went from completely not believing that there is anything underwater to believing that there are monsters underwater <laughs> because these things didn't look like what we are used to seeing. Angler fishes came out for the first time, light producing things came out. And of course, whenever you bring something from the deep sea, the pressure changes, they all explode. So they even look more <laughs> gnarly than they actually are. And so there's some very beautiful writings around that. So I think in the references, you should just think about what, how did people do this before? 
So I like the buoyancy thread. How would it collect samples? So I think the way that I'm thinking about it is things fall pretty easily. So that's not an issue. You know, even a penny that you drop in the ocean will get to the bottom. What you have to do is get it up and also retrieve it. The retrieval costs are a little bit, I mean, making a mechanism that when it falls, contacts, it closes, doesn't sound too hard to me. Uh, kind of like uh, the traps uh, that we use for animal traps and other things. There are several ways that you can think. The, the bottleneck there is retrieval. It's the same problem when the Japanese wanted to launch paper airplanes from space. They knew that the paper airplanes will cross the atmosphere, but they would land anywhere in Russia. And you have no, no sense whether your experiment succeeded or not. So if we were to do this experiment, even if it rises, how would you retrieve it? Um, yes. Can you maybe like only deploy the device in certain areas where you would expect currents to bring? It's somewhere near shore. Yeah. And so now suddenly I've added another functional requirement. There is the detect, there is the sample, but in the sample there is also retrieve. And you can see how interesting it starts to get already. The, the, the more you unravel your functional requirements, the more there is the design context. And I think the design context you're talking about is actually very similar to how weather balloons are navigated. So weather balloons are not at the, I mean, they're at the mercy or the Chinese spy balloon that everybody's <laughs> talking about. How the hell does it choose where it is? It actually chooses where it is because it looks at the weather pattern and it knows the wind conditions at the top and the bottom. And it goes up and down to essentially ride the waves. So Stanford has one of the largest uh, student balloon club. I'm assuming nobody is in balloon club, right? I don't know whether their permits will get removed now, but Stanford has been releasing balloons for the longest time. The club, I had a student in the, uh, in the lab and she was one of the captains for her year. They launched a balloon from here that passively went to Spain. They had all the permits, everything in, in place. And the way they do the navigation is what you kind of said. They know the currents and they had, I don't know how this was legal, but what I was told, was they had a mechanism that they could drop a marble uh, at any given time. So it could change the weight, but I was not sure what the hell happens to the marble. That's <laughs> but that's, that's the technology that's there, but in the ocean, it's okay. And you can then think about, could you passively, I think the only problem is that the, uh, many of these things have GPS that work in the air. Uh, but you could think about the, the sort of some retrieval with passive technologies. You know, there is the oldest retrieval technology for citizen science projects that's out there. I, I'm sure all of you have actually maybe done it in your life. Has anybody thrown a bottle in the ocean with a message that if you find, no, okay, but I've thrown it. I, uh, the Plymouth, one of the oldest marine stations in UK, it's recorded as the oldest citizen science project. They released around 100, 300 bottles. And all they said is, if you find this bottle, please return it and send the location. And they released them in somewhere in the 1850s or something. And last year, somebody found it. And Only then, one huh? Only one bottle? They found one bottle. I mean, they've been finding bottles and then they forgot about the project. And then suddenly <laughs> somebody found it and the Marine Station got this bottle. They didn't know who started that project because that person is long dead. But now they have the Guinness record for the longest running citizen science project because somebody returned that bottle. So retrieval can be passive. It's actually interesting to think about that if we had enough of them and if we engage citizens in a manner, then you could ask that, okay, you know, these sets of things. And again, you know, you're engaging people, you're engaging community that changes the dynamics of what you would think about. But the sample that it's carrying is so precious. Uh, and then people would have a sense, you know, just like I have a moon rock. If I found this little thing that had a message and it said, this thing has sample from four kilometers down in the ocean, please make sure you, you know, most likely people might. And so then suddenly retrieval becomes a passive and also we have included community in our solution in a way. And uh, okay, so I think 
this is the purpose. We're going to switch to another project now, but this is the idea that you want to run through. And this is just, you know, literally on a whiteboard and some amount of uh, background history. You can narrow your project down so that it's it excites you. If it doesn't excite you, then it's not the right project. And this is the balance. And I think we will do this basically for all projects to just make sure that you have the background knowledge. And then, so now going back just very briefly on the eDNA side, this thing has exploded massively, but there is one problem in this space. Uh, fungi, archaea, and many other unknown bacteria are much harder to detect than many of the other things that we are used to. So uh, I think, you know, when COVID happened, there were many fungal outbreaks that happened too with it. I mean, the black fungus in India was the worst one because it has 100% fatality. People would get this massive fungal infections. Nobody knows why it was happening. People thought it was because of the oxygen. Uh, the problem was that we have very little tools for detecting fungi and other things. And so the balance of this comes from that the technology should be chosen based on much more of what we expect from the sample. So the first thing you would do is now jump rather than from the design column, go to the reference column and find what is the current standard for detecting our kale biodiversity or certain sets of things that we don't, we're not, I mean, we don't even have many of these things as samples. So there is very little that's been done in technology development and that might feed back in your functional requirement for what tool. So I would put, in the detect, I would put the functional requirements and the eDNA will actually move into the design parameter. That's the key, is that functional requirement, you don't get to strike anything off from it. You can strike as many things in the design parameter column. You should have as many technologies that you list here, and then you have the chance to say, oh, this didn't work, so it's okay, I strike that and I'm just gonna go with sequencing as a possibility, but you don't get to strike anything here because this is your problem definition. Even if you can't find a solution that fits, I mean, that doesn't matter. You can't find a solution. That means it remains an open problem, but you cannot change your functional requirements once you've frozen them because you're committing to solving a hard problem. So you could put a price point here, for example, per sample, and then you could go back and say, oh, maybe I was, uh, uh, you know, I was too naive about it at an early time. Maybe I want to, this is okay to kind of load balance, but you cannot change the broad picture of your functional requirement because then you're solving a different problem. And it's okay to struggle with this column because you want to take the time to say, I'm actually on the right path. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other comments on deep sea? And then we're going to jump to another problem. Yeah. Well, one more idea, yeah. kind of more of a question, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we were talking about coupling like geotagging with the like sample collections. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering, like, I know you could like put like a latitude, longitude, but what happens at yeah. depth? Like, do we know how to yeah. tag what depth something? Yeah, so? I think that's a great idea. And that has a known solution because when things fall, they really fall straight. Mm -hmm. And so we know, we know the depth of the ocean, essentially very well so we have the sonar records so the place you drop it will be the sample point i think uh, because the ocean gets much calmer you know after the first five ten meters of the mixed layer the ocean is actually quite calm which is valuable for us because then it's not drifting away you can also choose what should be the ballast what should be the weight of this thing so it falls roughly in that same area where you dropped it Actually, this would be a fun calculation. If you drop a penny, like you can do this in a well, if you drop a penny from the top, how much drift there is in a penny? Mm -hmm. And you can do this calculation to show that after a given weight, there is actually very little drift. So you would know where the sample is. And because people know the depth, you would passively know roughly this is the depth that the sample came from. Um, I think the hardest part of this is going to be the retrieval side of the story. So it's just the problem is that you, how many do you have to drop so you have a constant rate of retrieval, right? And this is sort of a, a, a balance to think about. The other functional requirement that I would put here is what is the legal 
in like I would love to do this now. We could do this in Lake Lagunita. Nobody's going to bother us. We have the permits. But what does that mean from a legal point of view to do it in the open ocean? Uh, I mean, I think my intuition is that I think it's okay, uh, but we should figure that out. Like, I think it's valuable. Who gets to sample the deep sea? Um, and then again, there are shipping vessels that are going around the world all the time. You don't need any infrastructure for this. All we need to do is make our nodules, have them have the return tags to come in, and also have some sets of scenario that when we capture something, it is also going to preserve the molecular material because you might receive it in one day, you might receive it a year later, like using fishing vessels or other types of things to dropping, that's fairly easy because just dropping something somewhere in parts of the world where there is plenty traffic is fairly straightforward. I think this is gonna be a fun project. We should do this. We have permits in Lake Lagunita to test at least the passive rising technology. I mean, you could do this in the bathtub too. Right. Can for example, uh, you want to uh, get uh, like a water or some rocks or something? I think the idea should be is we should get some amount of sediment. There is no rocks, basically. Literally, it's kilometers of sediment at the bottom. So if you want to get deeper, then it's then you're doing cores. Then you have to use technologies that's on the petroleum industry. So I think, but the most unknown is in the sediment itself. Um, like most archaeas that have been discovered in uh, much of the bio, I think if you want to focus on this, the fact that deep sea mining is beginning and we want sampling technologies that can broadly tell us what's there, so we really understand the ecosystem better, sediments are okay. Having some amount of water right there is okay. I think then you would start making a balance around what volume that you're sampling. Uh, if this thing is a giant buoy, I can see it can be disruptive. It's not going to passively float away on a beach. People won't find it. Uh, so there are some limitations around the passive retrieval itself. Okay, so this is fun. Let's switch. Who wants to go next? Uh, let's just do this for a couple of times so you guys have the hang of it. You guys want to go? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Potency of okay, so I'm gonna flip this for a second. Uh, does anybody know how this thing flips? Is it oh, I could do that, but I I really want to flip it. Like there's an accent here. Ah, there we go. See, now I learned something. <laughs> Um, okay, let me just write the column. And then can you say who all is involved and which idea board are we on? Is there an idea board for this? Yeah. And then Kimberly, you should generate an idea board that's much more specific now, because I don't think okay. Deep Sea was listed in that, right? Yeah. yeah. And then that way you can post that itself in the idea board, grow that as a disease surveillance but it's 2023 right okay mosquitoes uh rapid tests further down oh no right there perfect uh okay yeah so what would be so maybe you could just first describe the problem or the question um, so there's actually two contests we're considering. Uh -huh. um, the first one is that in a lot of places, um, the relative male ships to those places and might be put in the different sea market. Yeah. Um, the second contest is in a lot of resource in this area, they rely on herbal medicine instead of like conventional pharmaceuticals. But the potency of those medicines depends a lot on um, the extraction process mm -hmm. and, and how stabilized it is mm -hmm. after extraction. Mm -hmm. um, and that has like big consequences on health. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I'm talking a bit weird because I got braces. Uh, no, <laughs> no, it's good. It's all good. We can understand you. Uh, okay, so I think, I mean, I love the context. That's fantastic. Having grown in India, I know exactly what you mean. Most people would just be so much more comfortable getting the traditional medicines. And you can't also just say that oh, they don't work because that's actually not true. 
I mean, every we talked about malaria. Artemisin is the Chinese medicine for fever, and it saved hundreds of millions of lives overall. So we shouldn't just say that because it's traditional medicine. It's just the issue is that the potency has not been measured. There's very little clinical data, and many a times that the processes that might might be using are actually suppressing uh, its potency to begin with. Okay, so I like that as a context. So then what's the what's the question or the puzzle? Like what would be the functional, what would we want to do to I guess change this scenario? We want to create a safe and rapid solution to testing these things. So mm -hmm. right now we rely on like lab um, equipment to test the uh, chemical composition or mm -hmm. like potency of like antibiotics you need to do like uh, those MIC assays mm -hmm. and stuff. So we're thinking about what other methods there are to test the potency or get a sense of the chemical. Mm -hmm. So one word that I'm kind of thinking about, this is something like a screening tool. So it can take, so functional requirement would be the throughput, first of all. I mean, of course, cost is a requirement, but one intuition is that you want to test many of these, this being general purpose, because it's not just one compound that you're after. You want to be able to take the catalog, say, of uh, you know Chinese medicine or someplace and say, okay, I was able to test 20% of all of those compounds for something, right? So throughput would be one functional requirement. You could do this manually and it would totally change the solution versus you want to do this in an automated manner. So you would write some kind of a throughput. Then to make it more specific, the other functional requirement that we would put is narrow down the disease uh, context itself. I think you said antibiotics is one possibility that would be very relevant. Uh, I think I don't know that much about the link between antibiotics and uh, traditional medicines themselves, but it would be valuable to poke at it because those are compounds that already people can tolerate as humans. So you don't have to do the big drug trials to say whether these things are toxic. Those people are already eating them. So it's fantastic to look for compounds. I mean, we, we have the toxicity assay already running. Most pharma works backwards where they will find this perfect compound and then they're like, oh yeah, it kills 50% of the people and it cures the other 50%, that's not okay. So that's very valuable as a resource to think about. Uh, and so narrowing down a bank of medicine. So what is the actual bank? Uh, and then mirroring it to a narrower problem. So I think, I mean, antibiotic is a great one because there are lots of external assays that can be used because antibiotics, bacteria can be seen. And then the first MIC assay is literally just the lethality on the bacteria itself, right? So um, if the test is externalized and it doesn't require a mice or a human or something else, it's useful. Like if the disease model that you chose for this right now was Alzheimer's, if you're gonna screen for that, you're gonna need, because the definition of the disease requires an animal model while the definition of a disease in this context doesn't require. So that's a useful trick to think about just because, and it might be that, no, 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 the disease that I'm actually really interested in is something that has to be recapitulated in an animal model. Uh, so is, is that correct? Like thinking about bacterial resistance and antibiotics? Okay, so uh, as a role for antibiotics, what are the other, uh, uh, like anybody else on the, let me close this just so people online can participate. Anybody else wants to? I don't know if you all heard uh, what Selena just said about a screening tool for testing traditional medicine and their efficacy. So we are listing the functional requirements for that. Anybody can raise their hands. You can type in chat. Uh, I think the more interacting we make, the more... Uh, uh, the more fun and a learning experience it is. I like, there's a lot of ideas floating, by the way, on the chat uh, on, uh, yeah, I think self pumps, all kinds of things. Okay, so yes, functional requirements. Uh, uh, for this one, no, yeah. I was even with you. No, 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 we switched. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know this is the fun part. A problem should excite you so much that you should just start thinking and it should start like, 
this is the, the when you really think about a problem, so many ideas just flow through you at all times. And this is almost a zone where you want to be a massive collection. And it's really fun to do this in conversation. So the goal is that I'm just getting this started for you guys. This should happen continuously. Jackson and then Baba. Yeah. I have a question for the team. Are you yes. still accepting members? I'm telling ah, yes. <laughs> yeah. The answer is yes to all teams because there is always a scenario. You can always do a certain piece of it. I think this should be fluid. Yes. Are we like are you making it like a frequency or are you like more like a function or just about five to four five minutes? Yeah, so I think the thread here is the first thing we want to know is whether it even works for a certain particular bug, right? So it's lethality at what dosage becomes very important. Then comes the next layer, which is if you know that it kills the bug in the outside environment, then you have to get to it because not all pharmaceuticals are absorbed the same rate. So you will end up in a situation where, oh, this thing kills a bug outside a human really effectively, but when a human takes this, the body clears the drug out and you don't get the same effect. So there are layers to it. And I think all of those should be included in some sense. Um, and so I think I would divide this up in uh, the assays can be in vitro, which are outside the body and in vivo, which are then in a human per se. But you can see getting clinical Ethical approvals for this might be easier because it's a common, already approved medicinal product. Um, yes. Oh, Yadnesh and then Tapan. Go ahead, Yadnesh. And then could you just do a quick introduction just so people start remembering names? Yes, sir. So I'm Yadnesh. I'm from <laughs> India. It's like floating in the air for all of you. <laughs> And I didn't have to pretend to call somebody Jack. That would be nice. Like maybe a, somebody wants to work on that, like a virtual bubble <laughs> in our heads. <laughs> yes, Yadnesh. Yes, sir. so I'm Yadnesh. Uh, I'm currently studying MSc in VIT Vellore. Uh, so I'm from India. Uh, and my suggestion would be we can use MIC for uh, testing the uh, like uh, whether the drug is affecting or not, like minimum inhibitory con concentration. And uh, then we can use uh, ED50 and LD50 dose, like a lethal dose limit and uh, uh, ED50 effective dose limit. Like what is, uh, at what concentration the drug is killing the 50% of the population and at what population the drug is uh, allowing 50% of population to survive. Mm -hmm. So that can be used to check the potency in vitro. Yeah. And then this will all be in vitro initially. Yeah. 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 So other, other comments, Tapan, go ahead. Uh, okay. So uh, I, I understand that uh, we are looking at it from the point of drug here. Uh, what, uh, it, the, uh, the, the tangent that I'm going on is uh, we use a lot of spices in foods, Chinese foods and Indian foods. We can measure each of the, well, so let's say, for example, uh, there is jeera, there is ajwain, there is turmeric, yeah. there is chili, and then yeah. there is, say, let's say, soy sauce. Uh, perhaps each of those have their own individual uh, bacteria killing capabilities that we are yet unaware of individually. I understand yeah. we use them together in the food. If, if it's, it's just a cheaper, well, some of the foods, they really help a bet person get better. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think. But Tapan said, I absolutely love the idea. And I think this is in that design phase column. And the functional requirement then becomes, oh, maybe I could broaden. What we call medicine is kind of a strange, like what is medicine? Food is medicine in some sense. We all get better. With it. And so broadening that to certain other compounds is fantastic, especially if the tool is cheap and it doesn't cost that much to test a large number of things. So if high throughput is combined to this, then we could test, you know, spices, we could test even other sets of scenarios of things that we are just commonly exposed to that might have a valuable. And I think there is another space in this, which is related. There is a huge effort right now to look for new uses for old drugs because they were approved. They are okay for what they do, but they might actually also do other things. 
And so right now, so for example, the Gates Foundation for Malaria Therapeutics had released what was called the Malaria Box, which was 100 drugs that were pre-approved for other function and they wanted people to do assays to discover whether any of them. So we don't even have, we could also include traditional medicine in that bank where we're just testing it for function. And then, you know, one big thing that I'm not such a big fan, I think it is a growing thread, is to also computationally predict uh, new functions for new drugs. But you know, unless you do an experiment, I don't buy that. But it has been done for a few things, uh, like some anti-dengue drugs were first predicted. But there was enough information already about the problem that you would have known if you read the literature so well enough. So I think there is a computational approach to this too. Uh, challenges, what is the problems that people see in this functional requirement? Does somebody see a risk? There's a very inherent risk in this that kind of derails a little bit of this. I wonder if it's obvious to people. We're just jumping a little bit ahead, but I think for this one, I can see like the legal thing that I said, I would put it in the risk column for the deep ocean. It's like, oh, we're doing all this. We made this technology, but wait a second. It's not legal to do this for some reason. I don't know, but like Nagoya protocols and other things. But in this one, does anybody see what would go in a risk column? Yeah. Maybe like uh, anyone can create some substance and be like, oh, I've run this test. Yeah. Like, it, it's bad. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think that is often as you make science more accessible, there is also an engine in science that enables, like you'd have to publish the studies. You would still have to, for you to sell it in a given market, you still need the same standard. So I'm not so worried about it uh, in the sense that I think this is too early in the phase. And when you do, you still need to do a clinical trial on humans for the study that would still go through the same ethical approval because it's in vitro. I'm not too worried about people testing new drugs and compounds in their garages. It's not happening. I think I would argue maybe it's not happening enough. And so the co early cost of discovery of drugs is, I mean, just, I was reading this one time, the chemical universe of just total number of compounds you can make is larger than our universe. Like this, this the combinatorics of how much you can make is insane in terms of thinking. Of, so we are so far behind, uh, but there is another risk. Yeah. Or just, I perceive one, but yes. Oh, it might be too related, but one, one risk that I thought in, in our research, one thing that we found that usually the case of fake drugs is that they have additional- uh, Exactly. And so, which they don't, it won't test for that. Yeah, but the other thing to say here is that the extraction is never pure. And in some sense, this is the big difference between the approach that traditional medicine versus uh, the what you would call Western pharmaceutical approach is that you try to purify the compound to its purest form. So there is not another compound with it that might be nullifying or doing another effect, which is hard because many a times you have not identified what compound it is. So if I take Jira, which tapan jira is a really fun spice. Does anybody know what jira is? Cumin, cumin right? Cumin. Okay, yeah, so cumin, yes. <laughs> uh, you can see I don't do grocery that much. <laughs> I know jira. Uh, it has a thousand chemicals. And so if you were to just make an extract and just add to it, then uh, what have you actually tested for? Because there might be one compound in it uh, and so one way of thinking about this is letting go of that idea and saying, no, 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 it's okay for it to be a multi-component thing. And we are just testing its efficacy in that multi-component format. We're trying to not reduce and not purify a given compound to its purest form. Yeah. Why are we call that a risk and not just like a challenge? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's risk in the sense that it breaks from when you're starting to do a clinical trial, for example, that's what the traditional thread is that you try to identify what specific active. And then the countermeasure to that is changing that paradigm and saying as long 
as you are seeing a positive impact, uh, maybe the cost of knowing exactly what compound was involved is too high and it's gonna add to the price if I'm seeing a consistent effect. So I think I'm putting it as a risk much more as when you're writing a clinical trial, for example, this is one thing that is a huge issue in traditional medicine when people want to run. There's lots of medical professionals that believe the healing powers of lots of compounds because they're just chemicals too. But when they start doing clinical trials, it gets harder and harder because you can't do the kinds of controls. You know, suddenly two brands of something that you got didn't have the core standard. There is no assay that you have that if you bought Jira or whatever, this route from two different resources, they changed. So I think that's the challenge. And I would say uh, it's, it's a little bit about thinking about, you still need to standardize to a certain extent because this is one of the big problems is the manufacturing processes are not standardized. Uh, so I think in terms of narrowing one big, there's one big missing functional requirement is what the assay would be. Is it an imaging-based assay? You know, it's easy to watch bacteria pop. Uh, Baba <laughs> does that all the time by sh shooting them with lasers and other, they explode pretty easily. So if, I mean, and most antibiotics are actually tested that way. So lethality is a pretty simple test. Uh, live dead stains are fairly common. So microscopy is how I'm thinking about it. Just because in a, in a week's time, we will be running a huge microscopy workshop for you guys for Octopi and Squid. So there is already a platform that we have built, uh, which would be straightforward to modify for this purposes. So I'll just show you guys uh, one of the images for it. Uh, this is kind of the platform that does automated large scale. Uh, oh, yes. So, and I'll I'll talk about it when I do the 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 squid farms. And so this is another one that we had built recently. So what you're looking at, it is an automated platform. It runs with 96 well plates. You can image simultaneously. Uh, so this framework fits very well with doing live dead stain assays. This is another example in which we can also do stains simultaneously. We can bring a drug, we can wash it, we can add it again, and we've automated the entire process. So it would be fairly straightforward to build the assay that you're thinking about. So now I'm being a little bit biased. So the purpose of this is uh, sometimes you have a technology that's sitting in your pocket and you're like, yeah, of course I can apply. This would be the short thing and you should still do it, but you still have to do the entire design design parameter for all the other things that could do this too. And you know you could still in early phases take advantage of the fact of a skill that you have or a tool that you have while with the Fred part, you have to be honest to make sure that you're also populating everything else because it will still teach us something. Like if I did find chili pepper kills bacteria, I wanna see it. Like, I think that's just fun. <laughs> So it's a low-hanging fruit that can obviously be done right away. You can run this thing that people talk about the how spicy something is uh, to <laughs> the level, like what would be the LD50 numbers associated with it. Uh, okay, couple hands. Yes. Uh, just something maybe more like accessible than using microscopy. Couldn't you also do like a Kirby Bauer test where you're just visually seeing whether... Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the thread would be is at what resolution is really the question. So if you're seeing it at a single cell scale, then you're doing microscopy. You can also do larger scale. I mean, if the bacteria that you're using, you can also plate them. There's lots of phase turbidity. So you can go down that pipeline and I would essentially write all of them. The reason for this one, I was thinking about the highest resolution of information is because not everybody needs to run this test in their garage. So the technology needs to be more broadly accessible. But once somebody has found a compound, then you just use the compound. You don't need to keep running the screen over and over again. So it's, it's kind of this balance when you're choosing what would be the price point you would associate with it. It's not so true. It's not a diagnostic test or the kind of test that we were talking before that has to be run for 70% of the earth. The number of compounds here, although large, can still be handled 
in a systematic manner. And again, this is where you make trade-offs. So the cost trade-off in this is actually slightly tricky. And the way I would propose this is work backwards. Write down the numbers for how many compounds are out there. Like what is the medicinal library of the world? Like all cultures combined, do an estimate. And then you say, how many labs in the world do you want to have this capability that within two years, we would have tested every one of them in a distributed manner. And so then if it turns out to be it's a hundred or a thousand, then I would take a much more, you can increase the cost. But if it turns out, if it's 10,000 or a hundred thousand independent people need to do it, then I would kind of go with that approach where the resolution of what you detected, because here you are producing evidence and it's an intermediate product. Your evidence has to be of the highest quality. So then you can add more cost to your solution rather than, because you know people need to rely on that. Then they don't want to be it's like, oh, I'm going to independently get it verified now with another because they didn't use the, the right set of the standard technologies. Yes. So I'm actually going to ask this. When we showed these the problem statements, who did you think would be the user? And for you, I think you immediately went to the lab. Yeah. Yeah. And this has to be in the functional requirement. So this should not be guesswork at all. You should write who the user is. User, and it will change. Uh, if we start doing this in a home setting, for example, then it totally changes the game. It changes everything. Because I am thinking of this much more when you described it as a way to bring rigor to traditional medicine. But that might not be the goal. You know, it might be another, it might be to bring uh, uh, a certain kind of sense of discovery in larger sets of community, you know. So it's, it totally changes who, what we will actually build and design. And I think this is why I'm saying that this functional requirement and design, it's a very important exercise to really do it with a knit pen and really spend time on it. I mean, you can spend a week on the sets of discussions we're having to emerge out of it, to feel like I feel comfortable. This is my project, right? And then of course, then you can come up with a simple way. And it might be that where you start and where you end is not the same when you think about this framework. Uh, other comments on this. We're going to do maybe one more before we jump to some other threads. Who wants to go next? Uh, does anybody have a project that they want to bring up? We'll just do this for another project. Anybody in the class? Anybody online? Have you guys chosen teams yet? Yeah, we're still discussing like projects. Yeah, which ones? Um, I don't think we formally got together to. Uh -huh. Yeah, have you put anything on the idea boards yet? Yeah, yeah. yeah. can I pull up which one would that be? Um, it should be at the bottom. Uh, which category? Waste stream. Uh, did I? This one. Okay, do you want to talk about it? What were you thinking when you were thinking about it? Um, I'm just thinking about the system of composting. Um, I think there seems to be like a big barrier to composting and people don't do it as often because of that. Um, so I'm thinking more about like the behavior of why people are so to do it. Uh -huh. like, so you to yeah. Yeah, no, I love that problem. It's such a, because I don't compost. So I can see what you are saying. And I, if I ask, I, how many of you compost? Oh my goodness, am I the only one? No, we have a few crowds. I feel seen. Yeah. What does mean compost? What does compost mean? Um, I think it's like storefront material that can be- uh, Biologically yeah. churned up. Up soil. Yeah, so to improve the microbial health of the soil, the food that we throw, we put it in an area, let microbes and other organisms, even macroorganisms, break it down to a certain extent, and then you throw that as a fertilizer for the fuel. Uh, no, I think this is fantastic. So let's drill in. What would be the functional requirements 
Uh, and I think, again, we have to start with, so can I erase this? Yeah. Um, and you know, I think this is what I'm trying to say. You might be sitting on a really fun idea, but unless you open up, I think I could sense a sense of hesitation. You didn't want to say it, and I forced you to say it, and I'm sorry about that, but I'm going to do this over and over again for everybody, because suddenly you have lit the minds of everybody else by just sharing that, and you know, I think you have something pretty interesting here. Uh, and so just this is the purpose of this class is often enough when we are thinking about projects and ideas, you often think like, oh, it's not good enough. Or it's not like, ah, I don't know if other people would engage it or not. It's just, but if we lower the barriers and just have conversations, the ideas emerge, the most interesting things emerge in conversations. You might say something and I'm thinking totally something else in my head. And suddenly it's sort of this miscommunication is a fantastic way to generate ideas. So we should do this more often. And I don't need to be the facilitator for these. I'm just doing this as to ramp you guys up. Like this should be happening nonstop now. Like otherwise this whole class is a failure in some sense. And I think the people that are hanging out even from two years ago in our class channels are because they enjoyed this process and they wanted other people to engage with. And this is something that you also have to do with the online community itself too. Okay, so let's go to the challenge. How might we increase recycling and compost efforts in low resource communities? Um, and I think it's an interesting, certain assumptions that are also there is to first, I would sort of look at data itself to just begin with, because this is a very data centric problem. Like we did a vote and I was very happy to see that most of you compost and I don't. And <laughs> I think it's it's interesting, like on Stanford campus, you might see this bias, but if you do the San Francisco, this might change completely. You go to a different city. There is a huge amount of rural communities around the world in the context of, uh, you break down a low income, uh, middle income countries, there is a huge urban population, a big rural population. The lifestyle in a rural, you might say the word composting and is like, what? Yeah, I mean, we, we always throw our stuff out there in the field and they are the farmers. And it, it might, they might ask this exact same question. You know, what do you mean composting? Like we've but been I doing- think People uh, who live in a rural area, for example, in Japan, they always compost. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's not a thing that you do, it's just a thing that happens around you just naturally because everything is flowing in in such an organic way. So I think I would narrow it down and I would put, first thing that I would put here is if in a LMIC setting, you should question yourself whether you wanna do this only in an LMIC setting or even in a setting that you have immediate access to. That's a total option. But I think the problem that you raised is not a LMIC specific problem. It's a people problem. And which is interesting, you could still choose to be. And if you were to choose this, then you might choose and find where is the smallest group or the smallest numbers. Like is, is urban cities uh, the biggest factor? And again, you know, going back, why is this a big problem first of all? which is if you look back at our estimates of the soil health, it is astronomically scary right now in terms of how we are losing topsoil. This is, I think we were talking about this, Selena, the other day in terms of the soil microbiome. The predictions are that by 2030, 2035, a significant portion of Africa will not be able to do the same growth plantations just because the soil quality is degrading massively. There are several reasons. Climate is one of the big reasons, but if you should just read a little bit about, it will give you this context of uh, soil health is becoming a huge challenge currently. So suddenly the problem that you're thinking about is actually addressing one of the largest food insecurity challenge on the planet today. I think I was just looking at these numbers for another reason. And uh, I'll share some papers in that context. So this anchors it a little bit that why do it? It's not just a fashion. It actually is incredibly important. Then you could say, which soils do we want to improve? Uh, you know, if you want to improve urban gardening and people in urban environments also producing their own food to a certain extent, 
then it becomes very valuable to link the two problems together. Uh, so what would be the functional requirements and how would you solve the problem? So I think the question, it's first a question, but then you want to move from a problem to a solution. And I think you pose that in, a, in this way of how might we increase. So the intention is to increase. So we should put some functional requirements. How much do we want to increase? Do we, yes. What would we write in this column? I, I was going to say this, this very much feels like you said it, it's a people problem. So you should start with talking to the people. Okay. It's a behavioral change yeah. intervention. Mm -hmm. and so, so, and it might have, you know, it might have a technology solution to it too. But the first thing in writing this functional requirements, the, the thing that you mentioned even comes before that, which is, uh, conversations and people both with data and actual conversation. And in design, this is a very classic thing. When you go and you talk to your users first to say, what is the actual problem? This would feed in into the FR to begin with. So you could have a set of conversations with students on campus, see if there is one dorm that's more compost friendly than the other. <laughs> Right. I mean, there could be these types of trends that you might see to begin with, uh, but then you will gather and, you know, maybe somebody might say, oh, I don't like my kitchen smelling. Right. I mean, that's I've heard that before and it's kind of interesting. Uh, there is this sense of uh, even that microbes are bad. So people, there is a very clear thing, and especially with COVID, there has been this very strong thread of thinking about, oh, my, microbes and bacteria, like many people not even spending that much time, we're not exposed to bacterial soil context often enough. So it will start changing the functional requirements, but then how would you think about the functional requirements for this? So if you were to make, let's assume after doing this conversation that people said it's too tedious, or I, I just don't like the, you know, either the odor or the volume of food that I throw is too large or then you can transition. And so are there certain sets of things that you would keep here? Uh, what would be the functional requirements to make composting easier? I guess that's one of the requirements. Uh, Anybody else, how would we come up? This is a little bit tricky one because there is a gap here where we don't truly understand why people don't compost. You should talk to me after the class. Yes, any cool. comments on what can we put here? Sorry, I was just like yeah. adding on, there's this one company that was recently funded. Yeah. They found a food jacket. Yeah, I saw that electronic thing yeah, and yeah. they say you put it in. I, I think the idea is like they, they will like, like the trash can like spits out this box essentially um and like they'll pick it up for you yeah so like the juice is all other issues and sort of yeah are we recording this or no we're recording I okay i won't say anything yeah <laughs> i'll tell you later <laughs> no i think it, it's it sounded a little bit like what was that juice the startup around the juice juice the squeeze you know juice you said, oh, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it has a, some of the semblance around that. I just linked it into this word. Yes, yeah. I think one thing to think a little bit about that is there is there is the compost version of that, which is very interesting. Uh, because then I think a couple years ago, uh, there was a fold scoper and she in she was living in Rajasthan teaching a school. And she, for the next 50 days, she actually imaged samples from her compost under a full scope and she created this massive database to just excite people like, look, so much exciting things happen. And that would have been the single most important reason I would have done it because the biology that's growing in, you just realize just the complexity of that literally shown to people too. Then it's not just a trash can that stinks, it really this, you're really curating it and and she was measuring at different depths. It's a really beautiful post. It's on Microcosmos. And I think her name is, um, it's not, not Sonali. It's, yeah, I'll, I'll find and post it. Uh, but I think it, it's important to tackle problems that don't just, you can't grasp it as yet. It's perfectly okay to tackle a problem like that because that's when you're honing your skills of how to transition this into a solution. 
if it if it's obvious what the solution is, people would be doing it right away. So it should feel if it feels this one feels a little bit intangible or a little slippery. Although I know that there's lots of technical things that are hidden behind it. Uh, one, I'll just mention this. It's a slightly separate problem, but we've been thinking about this for a while. Is this how to measure soil microbial biomass in a simple way? So I go outside and you say, okay, how healthy is the soil? We have the nitrate test. We have the phosphate test. Those are all chemical probes. They're not biological probes. So how do I know the microbial biomass of a teaspoon of soil? This is something that I'm super excited about. We've been thinking about this for many different sets of things, but also this would be something that has to be ultra cheap. Everybody should be able to look at the backyard and say, this is the health, and hence I need to actually improve it. Because if I show you the statistics of the soil, topsoil degradation and erosion, that's scary, but that's just a number. I don't know it for my neighborhood. I don't have a sense for what's happening to a farmer, for example, or how would a farmer essentially engage in something like that? Was there another comment on this? Yes, and then yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like even without talking to people, it seems like the biggest barrier is the convenience. Like the fact that you can just take like anything and just throw it into one bin is nice. And that seems like also probably one of the hardest problems to get around. Yeah, where, sorting. Like, yeah, sorting yeah. out the material is going to be really yeah. difficult. Yeah. 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 Are they? I mean, now suddenly you said this, then suddenly you can think a little bit in this context of what about sorting makes it difficult? Is it the cognitive decision that we make right at that moment? I mean, there are times I see five bins with five different <laughs> labels and I stand there for two minutes. Like, I'm not sure this is what I'm going to do. I mean, I don't know if you've all had that. So yes, yes, go ahead and then yes, yeah. Yeah, I think also, you know, this has a lot of opportunities of where exactly you put your intervention and take your advice because it would be about, like the person you mentioned, it would be about getting people excited to do it mm -hmm. maybe for that niche yeah. person that yeah. loves the science of it and wants to yeah. do it or it, and it's like a motivational thing that you yeah. can do to drop or it's the ease problem of actually the device itself that's accomplishing it for you it doesn't wash it you're able to see that it's the easy thing that it's very easy to know what you should put into it or it's at the other end what do you do with your compost then and then how do you keep measuring the soil yeah, no, that's a pretty cool idea. Lingo, like compost or whatever. <laughs> yeah. See, now suddenly we're moving into solutions, which is that if it's the, if it's that, oh, it's not joyful, you can bring joy to something if it's important by adding certain, like I was bring joy by adding a microscope to my compost bin. Somebody else might bring a Duolingo approach to it. And that suddenly you've trans. So now we have suddenly transitioned to say, oh, if it's people, if the problem was that it's not joyful, then suddenly you start writing the kinds of frameworks for the functional requirements. Um, okay, it's 11. Uh, I think we're gonna, I'll take some comments, but uh, Yadnesh, go ahead. Hello, sir. So, uh, yes. like, we can use. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. So we can use a probiotic strain. Uh, I'm not sure whether it will be cheap or not. Uh, but probiotic strain and introduction of lichen to it might be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, were you thinking about that yeah. in terms of faster? Composting or uh, sorry, I yeah, no, I, I think the reason I'm saying this is Tapan had a comment also on uh, methane and methane release whether there are actually yeah. odors and there is a particular odor that is what makes people not keep the compost bins, and then you can start thinking about a, a different way of solving that problem. Uh, but I think, yeah, it's uh, I, I love the slightly more intangible problems because it just gives you, you have to sharpen your skills because you can see how diversified the approach might become. I think the important bit would be is no matter what, you have to choose your target requirement to be very narrow. 
So I would even argue, go narrower than just like just college towns or universities. Like that suddenly, if you succeed there, that you can bring a hundred percent composting culture in that specific audience, you're at least answering that specific audience and then you can grow from there. So no matter which one you choose, and I think just because it's such a local problem, we just started the School of Sustainability and if we don't have 100% composting, what are we doing? <laughs> so I think it would be phenomenal to start here, yes. Yeah, one thing on, on that thread, um, I know like the dining halls do food waste surveys where they like measure everything that like people throw away off their plates. So you can try to yeah. do that with the compost bin here too. Yeah, yeah, and there is data then to begin with. It's like X number of people, what would that look like? And dorms are standardized. So you can implement certain services in dorms that you couldn't in people's homes to begin with. I think it's a really fun idea. Um, okay, so we're gonna stop here. Uh, but I think this is what I'm expecting to see on Tuesday, and we will have these conversations live. So the idea is we will push you on when you say this is the requirement, then you kind of have to be able to defend it. But the my hope is that this weekend and any amount of time that is from now till Tuesday, the moment you walk in this class, you're thinking about this to a point where you can defend yourself. Like it's a little bit because the goal to uh, disrupt your thinking is going to be is that then suddenly you've made a commitment and it's very important to be grounded in that. And we will do this as a kind of a rapid fire. Uh, we might think of a, let's see if whether we split in, depending on number of teams. I don't know as yet the number of teams. I like the idea of, you know, you know, maybe two people, three people teams, but if there is a solid enough reason that you guys have you, somebody wants to build a bigger team. But the expectation here is that everybody is pulling their own weight. So what I don't want to see is a team in which you just have somebody lingering that's not engaged because I will ask the other people. And if I hear that, then I will have a chat with you because there's no reason to take this class if you're not excited. There's like so many fun things you should be doing rather than sitting here. Uh, so just make sure that when you commit to a project, you're excited about it, you're spending the time, uh, and we don't have that much time, so I think we should get started. Uh, we have certain sets of funds for projects too, so as you immediately rise, the, the quickly we can arrive at, okay, this is a minimal test we want to do, we can actually start getting to a point where, I think from now onwards, I'm going to much more just focus on projects rather than much of the content. I think there is still some content and optics and some more projects I want to introduce, but it takes away from this type of a time. So at this point, you guys should just be trying to find me, the TAs. I will set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting after Tuesday, after I've heard everybody's, to just do a much more in-depth of what is the minimum target that we should hit in the weeks to come. So this is why I'm saying come back on Tuesday with very solid plans that you inside out, you know your problem. Uh, make a Notion page for all projects. So you should be presenting that through the Notion page and a Fred Park on top of it. Can we make a Fred Park template that we can give people? That's easy to do, right? And yeah, so we can do that. We can also just do a project template page if we want, like a dummy mock project. Uh, and this way, everybody will have a sense of what they want to fill. Okay, any last questions? Oh, yes. Uh, logistical thing. I think we're still not like able to add a page on the or a channel on the Discord. Oh, Abina is going to take care of that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think do do team projects. We are admins now, right? Ian, are you admin or am I admin? Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Why don't we send a message on to Ian and Abina for any channel you want to create? Yeah, because I think I see your point because then if everybody is admin, it kind of goes haywire. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. So just anybody, team projects, let's create that. Uh, and whenever you want to create any fun channel, like I think there should be just, uh, it doesn't just, there can be social channels, whatever anybody wants to do, just send a message. Yes. What's the LMIC? Oh, low and middle income countries. Oh, okay. Sorry. It's a terrible term. It's <laughs> like, what is, yeah. I mean, 
you look at India, it's like the richest person and the poorest person lives right next to each other. So what is, yeah, you are absolutely right. What is LMIC? I was reading this beautiful essay on like, we've been, everybody's been using this term sub-Saharan Africa. And there's so many problems with that term. It's like this massive old, you can't just pull that together. So I think there is a growing desire to not just put labels and think about the problem stripped away from this type of a, I think we use this for convenience. Uh, and in a certain sense, LMIC suddenly implies, I think I often use this in terminology that the stuff that we're doing in the class, you're designing in the context of haves and have nots, not developed or developing countries. That makes no sense. Like these terms have no meaning in that. They used to have meaning pre-industrial era, but now they don't mean anything. So haves and have nots is a good criteria. You can put a, a certain sector to say, okay, for a given family that's making this much income, that could actually be here, that could actually be somewhere else. And this is also where certain, uh, at the last ASTMH meeting, it was sort of, it was a controversial thing. You know, global health as a term is often used for poor people in faraway countries and like countries that people label as less developed. But then somebody did a presentation on showing the health statistics from Alabama and Uganda. And they are one-to-one. -one. It's like <laughs> all, and so then he said, so from now onwards, I'm gonna use the word global health for everything that has to do with Alabama. And he was right. Yeah. And everybody was so upset that why are we using that term? And then suddenly you realize that, oh, it's, it's it, that's, not, we should be looking at statistics and data to drive how we think. And it is true that even right here, people's health outcomes and the kind of resources that they have accessible are really abysmal. And so this is also, again, as you're thinking about projects, when you narrow it down, thinking about faraway communities is useful, valuable. If that kind of ticks you, drives you, if you have certain sets of context, we have many people online, but then also on the other hand, we should also just be thinking about uh, question these categories. Yeah. So it's not people that are uh, suffering from hunger, yeah? It's just a little bit more. I think low and middle income is yeah. something where um, middle income, I think there are dollar amounts put around it uh, in some sense. I think there is only three categories, low income countries, middle income countries, and high income countries. That is just not the right approach. Uh, there is a beautiful website that I remember, maybe one of you knows it, where you can type in, like, if I want to see what does a bathroom of just an average person around the world look like that makes this much to this much uh, in their price. And it's a photo site. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? It's the same person that did the world in data. He died and his daughter continued the project. It's remarkable because that's when you see this crazy thing that breaks your convention of what is a life of a person. Uh, I think some, yeah, I'll, I'll look for it. It's a uh, life in photo or anyway, I'll find it. Yeah, it's a very useful question. Okay, I think we'll say bye. We'll catch up uh, Tuesday. Uh, folks, oh, say that again. Hans Rosling, yes, that's correct, Nala. Uh, Hans Rosling, a uh, photo, Hans Rosling, and he died and his daughter started a project. Anna Rosling, uh, photos, people, oh, not her photos, a uh, project. images how it all start project rosling no i think it could be project rosling that say that again dollar street that's correct yes dollar street i mean it's just i can spend so much time on dollar street uh so i can type in here for example there to there and then this sort of gives you the sense of life of people. I mean, just from a context point of view, 
Uh, and then you can go in and read a given family and kind of what does that. So this would be the dishwasher. That's what the kitchen looks like. It just, I mean, first of all, it's very kind of people to open their homes, but then you can make it even more complicated. So like light sources in a living room. And I mean, look at this. It's just It's incredible to think about. And so now if we go light source in a living room and look at this, now you kind of see uh, the challenge of just, uh, you know, that would be the only light source. And then you can see that technology is not making it in that space. Uh, we could look at, oh, sorry. It's, sorry, I'm just, uh, I am on life on a dollar street. Uh, and again, you know, that by itself is a, a project that somebody thought about. They were thinking in this context and it's a, a big, it's the contribution of changing people's mindsets, for example. So let's look at something else here. Uh, meat. Uh, and then you see, <laughs> oh. you know, you see the breadth of, so Cambodia, that's what it looks like. Indonesia, that's, it's, uh, so, uh, yeah, I think you can, yeah, it's, <laughs> Anyway, it's I can spend infinite hours in. Yeah, I'll post that here. Uh, oh, it's Gapminder or no, it's changed. Okay, I think it's the same thing. So yeah, if people find new interesting trends there, then uh, do post them because I think as you're thinking about problem like compost, that would have been interesting to see how people compost around the world. And you might have already found the solution in how people do it in certain culture and just broaden that out. But I think, you know, you kind of have to spend some time. Um, okay, to be continued, I'll see you guys Tuesday. I'll be active on Discord. If you have questions, ask there. If you are stuck with your functional requirements, ping me. I'll try asynchronously answer. But let's do that as a way of creating a project. So instead of pinging me directly, ask Ian or Abina to create a channel for your project. And in that project, in the Discord list, oh, this is where we are. This is where we are stuck. Is anybody interested in having a online coffee? Talk to us for 10 minutes. And then you could just do a session like this with anybody. Uh, I think Discord allows for audio calls, right? So you could just say, oh, we're doing a brainstorming session. Anybody who wants to just join in and give us ideas. And then I'll see if I'm free, I'll jump in. But you can also just write in there if you have questions for me. Okay. Bye, everyone.